So last uh, slide about the Bayesian brain. We have the evidence, the sensory evidence, for example, and we have a set of hypotheses. All of the hypotheses could have been generating the evidence, but we might use the bias theorem to say how, how likely is each hypothesis given this evidence? So we take the likelihood and we multiply by the prior and we normalize by the probability of the evidence itself. This way we are doing inference. We are taking the current evidence and we are inferring which is the most likely hypothesis. Okay. We call the, these units visible units because this is where we observe the environment. We get the evidence. Okay. And we call these hidden units because they are encoded the hypotheses, which are not visible, okay? We have to guess them, we have to infer them. In this setting, learning, the, the goal of learning is to find uh, the parameters, which might be like the connection weights of a neural network, of a generative model that best describe, describe the data distribution. For example, we use maximum likelihood learning. We try to estimate which are the parameters which gives to this hypothesis the, highly, the high likelihood, okay? And if we go back to the example I gave you before, we have a, an ambiguous stimulus. We have different hypotheses. This can be a snake, a dog, a musician, a face, but maybe we know that from our prior knowledge, it will likely be a face because maybe we are in a place where there are many faces, okay? So this is the most likely hypothesis at this moment. Then what do we do? We collect evidence. We observe again the environment. Maybe we hear some notes, some music. So we say, oh, wait, I thought it was a face. But now that I get more evidence, I update my beliefs. The most likely hypothesis now is musician, OK? So you are constantly updating your internal representations, your beliefs about the, model, the, the environment, OK, using bias theorem. Well, the interesting thing is that we can implement this type of Bayesian brain into neural networks. They are called generative neural networks. And as you can see, here we don't have an output layer. We are not doing input-output mappings like with the supervised networks. We only have the input layer and a set of hidden units which represent the latent causes of the input. They represent the internal representation of the input units. They represent the features of the input, okay? So in a Bayesian perspective, these neurons, these hidden neurons are representing the hypothesis over the data which is observed in the input layer. And we update their activation every time new evidence is observed, okay? So you see now the connections are reversed. They don't go from the input to the hidden, but from the hidden to the input because the hidden units are the hypotheses which are trying to generate, to reproduce what is observed in the input data. So this way, the brain is no more passive. It's not passively waiting for the next input, like a feed-forward network. But the brain can generate, can actively interpret the available information. If one input is missing, or maybe two inputs are missing, we can take this evidence go up, compute the most likely hypothesis, and then go down and create some activations on these visible units, okay? So we might say, okay, this is a, a, a dog sniffing on the street, even if the information was incomplete, okay? So this is very important. We, we have the, the way to implement top-down effects on the, in the brain. Now, this was like the cognitive introduction, but I know you like uh, some more technical details. Fortunately, I've heard that you already knew yesterday about graphical models, so I will try to go pretty quick on this. The main idea is to use graphs to represent and manipulate joint probability distributions, right? Each node in the graph represents a random variable, and the edges, which are the connections, represent the relations among the variables. We can have directed models, which encode the parent of relations. This is like a Bayesian network. Or we can have undirected models, 
they only encode correlations between variables. Okay. The parameters and the structure of the model, of course, must be defined. In a theory-driven approach, we use a priori knowledge to design the structure of the model. In a data-driven approach, we learn them from the data. We estimate the structure and the connection parameters. Okay. I will be concerned with undirected models and with a data-driven estimation approach. Uh, as you will see, in fact, I will not be learning the structure of the model because the models usually are fully connected. So we start with a very general structure. But since we are learning the connection weights, some connection then can be discarded. So in a way, we also learn the structure of the model. So let's focus on undirected graphical models, also called the Markov networks. The edges are symmetric. There are no arrows. And they represent correlations. It's like an affinity relation between the variables. Each edge has an associated factor, which is just a general function from the real values to the real values, that indicates the strength of this correlation. In a neural network, of course, this is just the synaptic weight between the two neurons. This allows to factorize the joint distribution by defining the joint distribution as a product of local factors. You see, so we have all the factors in the network, phi. They can have a, a broad scope, but they can also only involve maybe two variables at a time. We, give a, we take the product of all of them, and we normalize for a, with a partition function, and we obtain the joint probability of the whole distribution. An important concept is the Markov blanket. Okay? It is the set of variables that, when observed, makes a certain variable independent from all the others. So this is, in this example, we want to establish the Markov blanket of variable D, B, C, E, the variables that are directly connected to, to, to it. Okay? The Markov blanket in undirected models is very simple. In Bayesian network, is a bit more complicated because you have to take into account the parents, the offsprings, and the parents of the offsprings because there's the explaining away phenomenon. But I don't want to repeat this. How can we perform inference in Markov networks? Well, it's a bit complicated because we have bidirectional interactions among variables. So in Bayesian network, inference sometimes is easy because we just sweep to the network from the top, from the parents down to the leaves, to the children. In Markov networks, it's bidirectional, the interaction. So every time we change one variable, we should also change all the variables that are connected to it. So we must sample all the variables continuously until we reach equilibrium. Computationally, this is very demanding. Okay. This is why inference in Markov networks usually it's approximated using efficient algorithms like sampling algorithms or mean field methods. I will focus on sampling algorithms, in particular Gibbs samplings, which are part of the family of Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. <clears throat> what is the main intuition for doing Gibbs sampling in an undirected network? So suppose the target va variable for the inference is D. We want to guess what is the value of D. We know the value of B, C, and G. These are the observed variables. But we don't know the value of A, E, H, F. So there are some variables are observed, some are not observed, and one is the target of our inference. How can we establish the value of D? Well, we randomly initialize all the un unobserved variables, so A, F, H, E, we are just random initialize them. The observed one, we know the value. And then we start to iteratively resample all the variables one at a time until we reach equilibrium. It is hard to assess if we reach the equilibrium, but that's another problem. So for example, in this case, B and C, we know the, the value. E, we don't know. This is random. So we assign a value to D based on this current 
shot of, uh, snapshot of the system. Then what we should do, we go back to E and we sample it again. It was random before, now we change the, the value of D so we can sample again the value of E. Okay, new value for E. Then we have to sample the value for H because H is affected by this new value of E. So we sample H. A and F, they are outside from the Markov blanket, so we completely forget about them. We sample again D, and then we sample again E, we sample H, so we keep on sampling these three variables, which are interacting together, until they reach like an equilibrium. They don't change no more. That will be the final value of the target value variable D. Okay. Imagine that there was another arrow here between F and H, in that case, also the value of f should have been sampled at every iteration, okay? So all the variables that have a common uh, edge should be sampled if their value are not observed, okay? So still Gibbs sampling is a bit computationally uh, demanding. In this case, we only had to sample three values or four, but if we have thousands of nodes, that requires a lot of sampling to reach equilibrium. How can we perform learning? Also here, I will just give you a general idea. We fit a generative model to a set of, uh, of observed samples. For example, you imagine a mixture of Gaussians or uh, an independent component analysis method. So we, have a, we observe the distribution and we try to infer the underlying factors, okay? But I will tell you more about learning in a particular type of generative models, which are the Boltzmann machines. We can also include temporal relations among latent variables, like in hidden Markov models or Kalman filters. So we have the evidence observed at different time step. First we observe E1, then we observe E2, then E3, and so on. And every time we update the hypothesis, the internal state, okay, in order to take into account the sequence of observations. Okay. Now, can we use these models to understand human memory, human learning? In particular, Markov networks, so undirected models. The inspiration for these models goes back to statistical mechanics. So, in particular, Boltzmann was very uh, inspiring, but also I, I just mentioned Gibbs sampling. Um, the ideas in statistical mechanics is, for example, with thermodynamics, we can use the microscopic properties of a system, like atoms and molecules, okay? So we measure the spins, the mass, the charge of these micro uh, components, and we, rela we relate them to the macroscopic properties of the system. For example, is the material magnetic, ferro ferromagnetic? So starting from microscopic properties, we try to establish which is the macroscopic property of, of the system. For the brain, this is similar. So can we establish a link between the microscopic properties, for example, of individual neurons? Okay? Is this neuron active or not active? And we try to see if the macroscopic property, like a global pattern of activation of the whole network, which might correspond, for example, to some mental state, to some cognitive state. So this is the general intuition for using the statistical mechanics to model also the brain. So IZ models, very famous in physics, they have been used to describe phase transitions in physical systems. We have a lattice like this, two-dimensional lattice of atoms, and they interact in uh, this very well-defined grid. Each atom can be in two possible discrete states called the spin, so like this, can be up or down, the spin of the atom. <clears throat> and the system as a whole, macroscopically, becomes ferromagnetic if all the atoms are aligned with the same spin, okay? The dynamics of such a system is governed by an energy function. The, the concept of energy function is very important also for Boltzmann machines, which depends on the temperature of the system. The temperature is basically driving the how much stochastic is the system, but I don't want to go into the details of the temperature. 
The main idea is that the system explores various configurations iteratively, it's like a constraint satisfaction problem, and it settles into the most likely configuration, which is that with minimum energy. So the energy is going to be minimized until we set to equilibrium. Usually, however, in these systems, we don't reach a uniform state. For example, where well, all the spins are aligned because the energy is globally minimized, but rather we settle into heterogeneous configurations where the system is locally, the, the energy is locally minimized. This is called geometric frustration. I have an example here. We start from a random configuration. We sample, we sample, we sample. And you see the screen is not becoming completely white or completely black, which means that the spins are not being completely aligned. They end up in a stable configuration like this. And it will not change from this point. This is a local minima. If we want to produce a ferromagnetic system, this is bad, because we want all these spins to be aligned. So this, is, this was considered a problem in physics, how to reach a more uh, homogeneous state. But some people in the neural network uh, community thought, well, maybe this is interesting, because we can have a system which has many stable attractors and each attractor might correspond, for example, to one different memory. So we can retrieve one memory depending on the dynamics of the attractor landscapes. Okay. Now, um, I'm a bit long with the time, but I want to show you a simple animation because I've been talking too much. In order to understand what I mean, Do we have the audio here? Yes. Yeah. So this is the case of a system. Imagine that each metronome is a, a different atom or a different neuron. OK. So the, in this setting, we have many different atoms, you can imagine, or many different neurons. In this ca case, there are metronomes, OK? And they, each of them has a different spin at the beginning, OK? One is going left, one is going right, um, OK? But let me speed it up a little bit. OK? And we let the system to evolve, OK? until it, it reaches equilibrium, OK? In this case, all the components can have a global interaction, because the base where they are placed is acting like a global uh, interactive device. So th they don't have just local interactions. And as you will see, in the long run, they will start to be synchronized, OK? So the, the energy of the system is going down, down to a, a global minimum. Well, all the components have the same directions, OK? You see? It looks like they are all, uh, OK, there's one guy over here. <laughs> there's also some people thinking differently. But in a while, they will also <laughs> become uh, conformed to the mass. <laughs> let's wait, let's wait. <laughs> yeah, he's starting to change his mind. Yeah, yeah. So you see, in this type of system, you cannot think differently. You will end up always with the same stable configuration, completely ferromagnetic, OK? All the spins are aligned. It, it is like, it is, if that was a neural network, it is li like saying that we have no memories, only one memory. We always think of the same memory at the end of the, of the process.
Okay. So we prefer these type of systems. Okay. Oh, I should take this off. Okay. Can you hear me? In this type of systems, the dynamics is much more interesting because we have many different local minima, and each local minimum might correspond to a different stored memory. Okay. So how to move from IZ models to attractor neural networks? We just replace atoms with neurons, and we make it possible to change the local interactions using some simple learning algorithm, like Hebbian learning. This is how we create Boltzmann machines. So Boltzmann machines are undirected, fully connected probabilistic graphical models. They have a set of visible units down here. This is where the evidence is observed. It's like the perceptual part of the system. And then we have a set of hidden units. They encode the latent features in the model. Okay? Interestingly, this model has been proposed by two computer scientists and one physicist, but it was published in a cognitive science journal. Why? Because it is a physical model, it has a nice computational properties, but it relates pretty well with the idea of having a, a cognitive system that can infer the latent factors of the sensory data. The global dynamics of this system, like in the easy model, is driven by an energy function, okay, which is minimized in order to reach some form of thermal equilibrium. So we might have a, the, the energy function can be shaped like this. You see there are many different attractors, and each attractor corresponds to one configuration of the network, to one memory. Okay. The problem is that this model is extremely demanding from a computational perspective. Why? It is easy to see because all the variables are connected to all the others. It is a fully connected graph. So if we want to do Gibbs sampling here, we have to wait years before the model is converging. Okay? So theoretically, what it, it was a very interesting model. Practically, nobody was using Boltzmann machines. But later, some people invented the restricted version of Boltzmann machines. In this case, we have a fully connected bipartite graph. So this means that we don't have intralayer connections here. Okay? We remove all the connection between hidden units or between visible units. So the computational complexity now is much more limited. I will show you why. Okay. Still, the model is driven by an energy function. And it's important to note that the energy function, this is the energy function E, of the configuration VH, we get rid of the biases, which is not interesting, but this is the important term. We have the connection weights, W, which are some way putting in relation the hidden and the visible units. Okay? So thanks to this energy function, we can define which are the most likely configuration of the whole network. Okay? So to describe the joint probability distribution of the visible and hidden units, we just take the product of all the local factors and we normalize them for a partition function. So you can see this is just an undirected graphical model with a bipartite structure, but it can be interpreted as an energy-based associative memory. There have been some refinements of this basic ar architecture. One was called the Helmholtz machine in honor of uh, Helmholtz who was proposing to interpret the brain as a statistical inference engine. And the most recent one, which allowed uh, to really boost restricted Boltzmann machines and make them popular again, was published in 2002. Hinton invented the contrastive divergence algorithm, which I will describe uh, later. What is the, the point of removing the connections here? Well, in this case, the topology encodes conditional independencies. If we take this hidden unit, then the Markov blanket of the unit is just the whole set of visible units, right? So if we observe the whole set of visible units, for example, we are perceiving an image, each unit, each hidden unit is conditionally independent. 
So it makes inference very easy. We can sample all of them together. So the probability of the hidden unit given the visible layer can just be taken as the joint probability of all the hidden units, OK? So we can sample them independently. So we start with the observation in the visible layer. We go up, where we infer the hidden activations. And then we can go back again, because from the hidden activations, we can sample all the visible units in parallel using what is called block give sampling. So since the units are conditionally independent, we can sample them very efficiently. So this is the trick that allowed restricted Boltzmann machines to be much, much faster than Boltzmann machines. And we can perform efficiently maximum likelihood learning by using the contrastive divergence algorithm. So the general rule for changing the connection weights using contrastive divergence, we just compute the correlations between visible and hidden units during the so-called positive phase. This is why I put a plus. This is called the positive phase. So we observe one training example, one image, for example. We compute the value of the hidden units in one single step. And we compute the correlations between the activations. OK, we store them. Then we start the negative phase. What do we do? We start from the hidden units, and we sample down to the visible layer. And then we sample again up to the hidden layer. And then we sample down to the visible. And we keep on sampling until we reach equilibrium. This is the so-called model-driven phase. At the end, we compute the correlations again at the end of this negative phase. We take the difference and we multiply for a small learning rate. This is the formula for updating the connection weights of a restricted Boltzmann machine. So let's try to look better at, at this contrastive divergence algorithm. Well, I have a yes, please. A yeah. The comment is that this is uh, basically very different from what I'm used to see, which is standard feedforward neural network, where you have input output and yeah. everything is deterministic. So you go from yeah. input to output, you use a way to propagate, yeah. and you get the output, you have a label, you get the difference yeah. back. Here, uh, you still have the input, yeah. but activation is probabilistic. Yeah. So that, that is the main thing that mm -hmm. I would like to stress. This yeah. was the, 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 the Correct. Thing, uh, important yeah. to, to emphasize for, for the student, for all of us. Yeah. The second thing that is pretty nice, this is like a stochastic approximation algorithm, mm -hmm. what you're doing there. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how, if there is some connection between this and stochastic approximation, because this is mm -hmm. a stochastic approximation yeah. approach. Yeah. So you have the whole value of the weights plus this uh, alpha, which is basically the learning rate, mm -hmm. which multiplies the difference between two things, yeah. what you have before and what you have now. Yeah. So you can yeah, yeah. Really comment on that. If yeah. there is some theory that is connecting the two fields or, or not. I guess it's exactly what you're saying. It's a stochastic approximation algorithm. You can use also variational approaches rather than sampling-based approaches. So you can train these models with exactly the same ways you train undirected Markov networks. So you, you look at the quantity. You try to change it with using the connection ways that you have at the moment. And you see how different they are. And your goal is to make them to be as similar as possible. So I, I guess it's uh, pretty much uh, connected. Yeah, but my, my question would be, is there any theory about uh, the rate of convergence, mm. <laughs> some stability properties? Yeah, so this is I see. OK, OK. I be concerned OK. About. So um, for the general case, so not for contrastive divergence, so if you really, now, next slide is going to help me. Um, the idea is that we start with some inputs, we go up stochastically, and we reconstruct stochastically. And we try to have the two quantities to be the same. So it's like looking at how the model expectation is distorting the data. If you do it properly, this is the, the, the complete Markov chain. So in the positive phase, you have the data here, and you have the activations here. You compute the correlations. This is the first term. Then what you should do, you start from a random configuration, and you sample, and you sample, and you sample, and you sample, and you keep on until the Markov chain 
has finished, this is the negative phase, which is the model-driven phase, okay? And you compute this term, this can be shown to be able to converge, okay? So it has convergence properties, but still it's very slow. So the convergence properties are not that good. So you might have to sample, uh, maybe starting from different initial random configurations or maybe using simulated annealing procedures, so use the temperature to improve convergence. So in principle, there's an analytic treatment of the models which says, yeah, you can train them. But then in practice, it takes a lot of time to do things properly. So this is where, why, this is the original algorithm proposed in the 86. Nobody was using it. Even if it is, was better than Boltzmann machines, restricted Boltzmann machines were still uh, kind of too much complex from a computational point of view. But contrastive divergence introduced uh, a very powerful approximation, which is this one. Okay, we stop during the first iterations, okay? So instead of starting from a random configuration here and sampling until the Markov chain converges, we just start from the very same configuration produced during the data-driven phase. We reconstruct the visible units and we sample again the value of the hidden units. So we just uh, one, two, three steps, okay? And we stop here. This is called contrastive divergence one because we only try to reconstruct the input one. And it has been shown to be practically very efficient, but it has no analytical treatment. We don't know why it is working. We are just distorting the data and it is working in practice to, to find a good set of connection weights. But in theory, we are not optimizing the, the likelihood function. We are optimizing a slightly different function, which is the kullback libler divergence between two functions. It's a bit, uh, so from a theoretical point of view, we don't really know yet why restricted Boltzmann machines trained with this approximation of, in the contrastive divergence are working so well. But yes, in principle, there are some good analytical treatments. So basically, you stop immediately. Yeah. You have a truncated process. Yeah. You stop it at the first step. Yeah. Because you are starting from the data rather than starting from a random configuration. So it's like looking into the neighborhood of all the data points. So this is why you also need a lot of data points, because you have to sample all the space quite uniformly if you want to cover all the possibilities. If you have three examples, you will optimize only the neighborhood of these examples. But then you see something different, and the network is not able to process it. OK. OK, so I can go into the details of the algorithm, but let me skip it. Uh, we can look at it if you are interested in the, in the technical details. But basically, this is an interesting learning rule because it uses only local information, so only pairwise correlations, and you don't need any supervision. So you can see why they are unsupervised. You only have the input, and the optimization goal is to be able to reconstruct the input by first compressing the data into a hidden representation. There is a very similar type of architecture, which is called feed-forward autoencoders, shown here on the right. So a restricted Boltzmann machine, you have undirected bidirectional connections, one set of weights, visible hidden units. In an autoencoder, you try to do the same with a feed-forward architecture. You have an input layer, visible units. You project it into the set of hidden units, and you project it into a set of output units which must be the same of the input. So VREC means uh, visible or reconstructed. The goal is that this layer is exactly the same of this layer. This, in this case, you can use error back propagation to train the network, okay? But the difference is that you don't have the stochastic problem, so it's not probabilistic, the model. And also you have two sets of weight. You can have them being the same if you put additional constraints. But in principle, these models are kind of similar because they try to extract features, a compact representation of the data. But in practice, they can be different. So we have been studying them, and we found that restricted Boltzmann machine 
develop different features from, uh, compared to autoencoders. So you can imagine them as being some way similar, but not in practice. Okay. Now the interesting part, we can build hierarchical generative models by combining multiple Boltzmann machines, restricted Boltzmann machines. And this wa was published in 2006 in Science and was really the starting point for the deep learning revolution. So the deep learning revolution started from undirected, unsupervised models. Then it, go, it went back to convolutional and supervised networks. But in the 2006 paper, a central uh, key point was the use of restricted Boltzmann machines. So how to do? We just train a restricted Boltzmann machine like this, and then we use these hidden activations as input for a sequent, subsequent restricted Boltzmann machine. So we train the first layer, okay? we complete training here, and once we have a good set of connection weights in this layer, we just calculate for each image or for each training pattern its internal representation, and we use these activations as input for a second restricted Boltzmann machine. Okay. So the goal of this second layer will be to reconstruct these hidden representations. And if we interpret it in a kind of a probabilistic way, this way we are building multiple levels of representation by building hypothesis over hypothesis. So this first uh, hidden layer will say, which is the probability of this set of hypotheses given the visible units? Then when we go up, we ask, which is the probability of this other set of hypotheses given the first order hypothesis? So this is a way to be, create hierarchical generative models. And we can also go top down. So we can go down and infer, again, sample some hypothesis at a lower level, taking into account higher order information. And then we can go down and sample again the values of the visible units. So this way, we can stack together many layers and build hierarchical models of increasingly complex uh, structure. Okay. The big point is that we can extract abstract features in an unsupervised way. Okay? And we are reusing and sharing low-level features. So the computational complexity of these models is improved because we are sharing knowledge. Okay? So something that we have been learning here can be reused, reused by subsequent layers. And also keep in mind that each layer is performing a nonlinear projection of the input. So we are projecting every time the representation in a nonlinear way. So this is why at higher levels we can really have very complex representations because we have been combining many nonlinear functions. Then once we have built a good representation here, we can also perform supervised learning. This is something very similar to what you have been seeing with uh, Fabio Aioli. You try to build the representations in a nonlinear way, in a po possibly unsupervised way. Then when you have the feature space, which is higher order, higher level, which is more, which is more abstract, you can train readout tasks, like you can train classifiers. Rather than starting from scratch, from the raw image, you already use the high-level representation built during the feature extraction process. And you can train multiple classifiers, even linear classifiers at the top layer. So in analogy of what happens with the uh, vector machines, we, have, we might have data points which are not linearly separable. In this case, they are. We just draw a line here. In this case, they are not. We need two lines to separate them. But if we first project them into a nonlinear space, then we can easily separate them using a linear classifier. And in the more general case, we start from the input space, which is not linearly separable. We use a kernel function to project each data point into a feature space. And here we can separate maybe with a linear hyperplane, the, the, the two classes. Okay. So this is what happens with support vector machines, but also with deep learning. We start from the input space, and through a hierarchy of nonlinear processing units, we project the data into a more meaningful and abstract internal representation. 
So this is very common also in computational neuroscience, in vision science especially. We want to separate two classes, the cars from the not cars. But perceptually, they look very similar sometimes. This image is very similar to this one maybe even more similar to this one than to this one. So the intra-class similarity is lower sometimes compared to the inter-class similarity. Or maybe we have a car in the savanna and we think it might be an elephant, okay? So what we have to do is to build a more appropriate representation of these images in, fine, in, in such a way that they can be easily separated. So there's a theory from a neuroscientific point of view which says that the goal of the ventral stream of the visual cortex is exactly to disentangle these two manifolds or more manifolds. We have two manifolds, one representing all the cars and one representing all the planes or the jets. We want to separate them, but they are not linearly separable because maybe the light, the viewing condition is making them intertwined. So we project them by many layers of hierarchical processing into a feature space where classification, where linear readout is much more easier, okay? So this is what is supposed to be the goal of the ventral vis visual stream, okay? And this is also why deep neural networks are doing so well in machine vision, because they are mimicking this type of transformation. So starting from the retina, we build a moderate level representations, for example, V1 cortex, we try to detect the edges of the, of the images. In V2, we detect the, the borders, the corners, the junctions. Then in the inferotemporal cortex, we have associative areas. We can represent uh, geometric shapes, uh, faces, uh, more complex features. And these abstract representations can be easily read out by a linear classifier. So let me stop for questions before going on with the second part of the lecture, which is more focused on um, applications and practical examples. Any you can save the questions for later. We have a 10 minutes break, 15, I don't know, okay.